This segment here is going to be on uh, rattling. Uh, it's something I've I've done quite a lot of. Uh, when I travel out of state, I rattle almost every single hunt. I, I'd say probably 80%. Let's be honest. Uh, in Michigan, I don't do it as frequently, but I have I have rattled in bucks in Michigan and shot them that made book. And uh, one thing about rattling that I see when I watch the few times that I do watch TV is TV guys rattle extremely aggressively. They have big antlers. They make a lot of noise because where they're hunting, there is a lot of mature bucks. And the bucks that they're rattling, trying to rattle in are 140 to 200 inches. So most of you do not have the luxury of hunting in a zoo. So, uh, you know, you, if you try to replicate what they do and assume it's gonna work where you're trying to kill 100 to 125 or 30 inch buck and that's a five year old buck, 125 incher, uh, that aggressive rattling is not gonna get it done for you. Uh, you can't be that aggressive, you have to be more subtle. So I'm gonna start out with uh, antlers. These are some antlers, this is a little eight pointer I shot back in the 70s. And uh, I actually cut, cut some of the tines and blunted them down. And I'm not a big antler guy. You know, antlers take up a lot of space. They're tough to hang in the tree. They, they wanna make noise all the time. And they just, they're just cumbersome to carry around. That's why I don't like tree stands. That's why I'm not a big stick fan. I like stuff that's sleek that I can carry in a backpack because I'm going through shit all the time. So, but if you do have antlers, they do work. They obviously work. Don't have a great big set because you're not gonna be aggressive. Uh, the thing about rattling, it's when you do it, it's where you do it, and it's how you do it. Not only is it on the how side, it's, it's the length of time you do your rattling sequences, how you pause in between, and how loud they are. Because in pressured areas, you know, you may only have one or two bucks that are over 100 inches in a section, in a 640 acre section. So, you know, they're not used to hearing aggressive stuff. It spooks them more often than not. I was hunting with my son once and we picked straws on who was gonna rattle. He was on one side of a marsh, I was on the other, and it was about 200 yards between us. And I can remember there was, this was in, I think it was the late eighties, maybe early nineties. Anyway, he won and he was young. He was maybe early 20s, and I hadn't really gone over a lot of rattling sequences with him. And uh, I saw an eight-point buck, and I, we decided he was going to rattle at 8 o'clock. And this was obviously a morning hunt. I saw a buck coming down the edge. It was a really nice eight-point, and uh, it was right about 8 o'clock. And I'm, I'm looking at my watch, and I'm like, oh, God, he's going to start rattling any minute. And this buck's just slowly walking down the edge of this marsh on the edge of the timber on the other side. And as soon as he started rattling, he did it really aggressively. And that buck, he turned around and left so fast, it was unbelievable. And that was probably one of the more dominant bucks in the area. He had just never heard that aggressive of rattling before. So the aggressiveness has a lot to do with getting a response if you're hunting in a pressured area where they just don't hear that type of aggression. So anyway, this is a small set of antlers. And if you were gonna rattle, this is kind of how it should sound like if you're in a pressured area. Tickle them together for a few seconds. Give it a gap. It's almost like they're sparring. Because if you, if you do that kind of stuff like you see on TV all the time, it just isn't gonna work. Typically, early season, bucks are basically, they're sparring, they're just putting their antlers together and they're pushing for pecking order. You know, they're not having all out blowout fights. They're just pushing each other for pecking order. And, and they just do it nice and subtly. To give you an example, I've killed three, three Michigan book bucks in the first two days of our bow season. All three of them were morning hunts and all three of them, I rattled them in. One was in, two of them were in bedding areas and one was in a transition zone between feeding and bedding. And uh, all three times, two of the times, I actually heard two bucks sparring in the distance. And then as soon as they finished, I just tickled, I just replicated the sounds they were making, just tickling the antlers. And again, I was not using this, I was using a bag, but I was just tickling them. And they both came both times, those two came right over to me and I shot one at eight yards and one at 12 yards, two different times. The other time was in a transition zone. I saw some feet going 
threw some timber, some legs, and I had no clue if it was bucks or does, but they were heading to a bedding area. Um, and I'm like, well, they're not coming to me, so I might as well try something. So I did a sparring sequence, a real soft sparring sequence, because they were probably 80 to 100 yards off. And they turned and they started coming my direction. And when they got about, and I was in a lot of oaks, there was a lot of oaks in the area. When they got to about 40 yards, I could tell they were both bucks. One was an eight and one was a 10. And they lost interest because it probably took them five minutes to go that 60, 60 yards so that they were within 40 yards of me at this point. And they started eating acorns under this oak tree. And after a few minutes of that, they kind of lost interest because they obviously didn't see anything in my direction. They didn't see two bucks sparring. So they started going back towards the bedding area. Well, now I'm in a dilemma. Okay, do I rattle? No, I don't rattle because they're within visual sight of me now. They can see my body in the tree because I can see them. So if I did a rattling sequence, which takes several seconds, they would obviously turn immediately and pick me in the tree. They'd know that noise is coming from up in the tree. Plus they couldn't see two bucks, you know, moving around and sparring. So what I did is I took off, took out a soft inhale grunt call and I turned around and did a real soft inhale grunt I might as well show you. This is an inhale grunt call that I physically made. I just did a real soft inhale grunt and both of those bucks turned and came in 15 yards, 12, 15 yards and I shot the 10 point. But anyway, keep rattling very subtle if you're hunting in a pressured area where there's not a lot of monster bucks. Now these are some bags that I've had over the years and there's four different bags here. I've had others. Three of them, in my opinion, suck. This is the one I use, but I want to show you the difference. This one here, yeah, this actually is a night nail, which is what I use, but it's a different kind of night nail. This one is full of plastic sticks, plastic pegs or whatever. And there's a lot of them. So it's, it's when you move this thing around, there's just too much clatter. It's just too, too much. Now this one here, it's just it's exactly the opposite. This one's probably got 15 pieces of plastic pieces in here. This one's got four. There's four pieces of wood in here and they're inch diameter. So it's kind of hard to get them to make a noise because they're so close to each other and they're big. It's just hard to make that work. And then this one here, this is an old Eastman Eastman Outdoors, which they made Gorilla Tree Stands. Um, they make Carbon Express Arrows now. Uh, this one here, the sticks are really tight in this bag. And this bag here is not a bag you can open up and take a stick out. Because a lot of times, like with this one, if I were actually gonna physically use this, I'd take these sticks out, probably cut them in half and only have six of them in here instead of four monsters. I'd, I'd make it six smaller ones or else five smaller ones. And then that bag would work okay. But this one here, the sticks are so tight together, you can't even get hardly a noise out of it with any volume at all. Now this one here is one I've had, I've repaired this many, many times. This is a night and hail also. So it's the same company as this. And this, but this is an older one. It's got five sticks in it. As you can see, I've got a safety pin holding it together right now because it needs to be stitched up again. I've restitched the bottom. But this one is absolutely perfect. You can separate the sticks because there's plenty of room in the bag. So you can get aggressive if you have to. But if, for sparring, you do it for like five to 10 seconds and you give it a three or four second gap. Because if you ever saw, if you ever hear buck sparring, definitely pay attention to it because that's what you're gonna want to replicate. Um, I've heard lots of four points and six points and small eight point sparring. So all I do is replicate the noises they make and it's not, it's not this aggressive stuff like you see on TV. And this isn't even half as loud as what you get with antlers like the guys on TV. So keep it, keep it subtle. You know, don't clash all the time. It's just tick, tick, tick. Cause that's what they do. They have a lot, they tick their antlers together and then they'll push for a few seconds and they'll move their antlers around a little bit and then they'll push. But uh, rattling, 
works great. It works, it works phenomenal during the early part of the season because the bucks are sparring and you know pushing each other for pecking order. Uh, but you got to do it in the right types of places. You know, you've got to do it in places where you've got a lot of security cover because if you're going to rattle, obviously if a buck comes into it, he's got to be in the right frame of mind first. But if the buck's going to come into it, once he gets within a specific distance, if it's a mature buck, if he can't physically see two bucks sparring that were making the noise, he's not going to commit to coming in close enough to give you a shot. So you want to do it in a place where you've got some ample security cover around you where some deer could be hiding behind some brush or something. And then if he does hang up, don't rattle hit it with a soft inhale grunt call if you got an inhale. Most, most grunt calls are exhale, which I'm gonna show you in a while, but they do sell some inhales and they're just a lot softer. So early season is a great time to, to rattle in bucks because they're, again, they're sparring for pecking order. And um, pre-rut is another good time. That's when, you're, that's when the bigger bucks, the mature bucks start to actually battle. That's when they're actually fighting and pushing and as hard as they can, because now they're basically, ra or, uh, they're fighting for breeding rights and dominance. So it's a little bit more aggressive. So during the rut phases, pre-rut and even during the main rut, I'll get more aggressive with my first sequence. The more aggressive you get with that first sequence, obviously the louder it's gonna be and the farther an animal can hear it from. The foliage is gonna be down, typically, so you're gonna be able to see that there's nothing probably within 50 to 80 or 80 yards. So you're trying to call something from a farther distance. So you can be more aggressive with that first sequence. And then when you do another sequence, I always do two sequences, five, usually about five minutes apart. That second sequence, don't be aggressive. Cause if that first aggressive rattle did not, or got their attention and they were not in the mood to commit to coming, the second one's probably not going to make any difference either. So the second one should be, you should start that one out a little softer. Now, obviously, if it's raining or if it's windy, you got 15, 20 mile an hour wind, you can get a little bit more aggressive so that the distance carries farther. Uh, but if it's dead calm, you'd be shocked. They can hear subtle sparring distance, subtle sparring sounds from a really, really long distance. Um, and I have rattled several in during, during pre-rut and rut. Um, out of state, when I go out of state, when I went to Kansas and Iowa uh, in November, I, I would almost bet 50% of the time I rattle my bag. I do a sparring sequence or a rattle sequence. I, I have a response. Obviously 80% of the time, 78% of the time, it's a subordinate buck and they come in and it's funny because they'll they'll come in and then they'll walk off after five minutes and you they get 80 yards away do that again they'll come right back in uh, but it works great out of state because in those kind of states because there's not a lot of hunting pressure and they respond to all kinds of tactics really really well um, that's due to the pressure they haven't get shot haven't got shot in that before um, probably another really important thing when you're whether you're doing any kind of calling, whether it be grunt calls, fawns, doe, doe bleats, and I'm going to show you all that stuff. Always, if you're in a destination location, let's say you're hunting at a mass tree, an oak tree, or a beech tree up in big timber areas where there's no ag for miles, uh, choke cherry tree up in big ag areas, uh, if that's a preferred food source because there's no oaks, or in the south persimmon trees, uh, or a, a fruit tree, an apple tree, or something like that, or if you're at a primary scrape area, those are destination locations. Always, 100% of the time, always, if you're at a destination location and you're hunting it for the first time, let that location work on the merits you chose it for. Don't do any tactics. Don't spray anything. Don't use scents. Don't use anything. Let the location work on the merits you chose it for. Because you chose it because it's attracting does and does are attracting bucks or it's a primary scrape area so it's attracting bucks. So let the location do its thing. You hunt it again, you know, maybe the first two times you'd hunt it clean. And then the next time you, you run some tactics. And when you're gonna do a rattling, you know, if I'm, if I'm on an all day sit, I'll t 
typically that's going to be in a bedding area. So if I'm going to do an all day sit and typically it's going to be during the rut phases, pre rut's my favorite time in Michigan, out of state, it's post rut. Um, I will do a sequence about eight o'clock. Because once you're in a bedding area, they're already in there and they feel secure. They probably moved in there before daylight. So they're secure moving in there because they could hear anything coming in and they'd spook from that. So they're secure in the bedding area. So they're possibly up moving around, especially during the rut phases, uh, even though they moved into it before daylight. Um, about 8 o'clock is when I'll do a rattling sequence. I'll do another one at about 8.05 or 8.10 and then I'll do another one at maybe 11 or 12 o'clock in the middle of the day maybe one more at three o'clock and then one more about a half hour before dark. Uh, the, the one, typically the one in the morning or the one half hour before dark is gonna be the one that you're gonna get your response to. And you wanna do, you wanna wait until it's relatively close to dark so a big buck's gonna feel comfortable getting up and moving, you know, as opposed to during the middle of the day. I, I've done a lot of rattling in bedding areas in the middle of the day in Michigan. I, can only think of one time I had a response from a, like a 100 inch eight point, which I didn't shoot. Um, but uh, typically mornings and evenings are where you're gonna have your best best luck. And you know, always do two sequences, always do a lot, little bit louder sequence, the first one, always have gaps. Maybe you're gonna do a 30 to 40 second sequence all together. You're gonna have at least three or four gaps in there where you, you're making some noise. And then it's gonna be a gap for four or five seconds, and then you do it again. But just just tickle those things together, just tickle them, that's all you gotta do. Um, that's all I've got for rattling right now, it's all I can think of anyway, I'm sure I'm missing something. Um, but again, probably one of the most important things, don't replicate what you see on TV. Unless you hunt managed properties, or you're hunting in Iowa or Kansas, or Missouri where there's lots of big bucks, or Nebraska, Dakotas, uh, don't replicate what you see on TV because if you hunt up in the Northeast or the Midwest, east of the Mississippi River, um, you're probably not going to have much for responses. You're probably going to spook more than you call in. Thanks for watching another episode of Eberhard Outdoors and please like and subscribe.